Our scripture this morning comes from the Gospel of Luke, the 24th chapter, beginning at the 12th verse and concluding, beginning at the first verse, rather, and concluding at the 12th. On the first day of the week, very early in the morning, the women took the spices they had prepared and went to the tomb. They found the stone rolled away from the tomb. But when they entered, they did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. While they were wondering about this, suddenly two men in clothes that gleamed like lightning stood before them. In their fright, the women bowed down with their faces to the ground, but the men said to them, Why do you look for the living among the dead? Remember how he told you while he was still with you in Galilee. He is not here. He is risen. The Son of Man must be delivered over to the hands of sinners, be crucified, and on the third day, raised again. Then they remembered his words. When they came back from the tomb, they told all these things to the eleven and to all the others. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and the others with them who told this to the apostles. But they did not believe the women, because their words seemed to them like nonsense. Peter, however, got up and ran to the tomb. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I'm going to preach this Easter Sunday morning on the theme, Victory Over Death. Church, have you ever asked someone a question and were completely dumbfounded? flabbergasted, taken aback, or, or verklempt by their response? If that's not you, let me warn you. Do not talk to my children. <laughs> I know they look really cute in their Easter Sunday. No, no, don't do it. Do not talk to them. Because if you do, you might ask them a seasonally appropriate question like, what does Easter mean to you? And you would be shocked and appalled by their response. You'd be shocked and appalled, Lindsay, because my children are not ordinary children when it comes to church. They don't just have one pastor for a parent, they have two pastors for parents. And so they have spent 99.9% .9 of their Sundays right here in church. They've gone on service trips, they, they've sung in choirs, they've acted on stages in church plays, they've been in VBS, youth group. If anyone should know what Easter means, it should be them. But no, that's not what I got when I asked my six-year-old Isabella, what does Easter mean to you? Do you know what she said? Eggs. I said, okay, okay, just take a deep breath. We just started. Uh, uh, maybe you want to mention Jesus, the cross, or crucifixion. And she said, oh, yeah. Big eggs, <laughs> L little eggs, different color eggs. I had to cut her off uh, because I thought, you know, you're young. There's still time to lay hands on you. Let me move on to the next one. I go to my daughter, Olivia, my nine-year-old, who I preached sermons while I was pregnant with her. I, I taught Bible study while she was strapped to my chest. This daughter of mine should be able to give a clear and accurate theological response to the question, what does Easter mean to you? But no, she said, ham. <laughs> oh my gosh, that ham in the golden wrapper with the crispy crust? Ham! Well, 
you know, there are at least two things that are clear. They are both written out of the will. So I, I went to my son, my firstborn child, who has spent more time in church than any of the others, surely he would have a correct answer to the question, what does Easter mean to you? But I don't know why I got my hopes up. Because he's a tween. And he responded like all tweens do. You know, with that immediate irritation, that, that guttural breathing that sounds like Darth Vader is gargling mouthwash. <sighs> That, that, that monotone voice, mom. <sighs> that, that body language that's as if they had their spine surgically removed and it's painful just to have a conversation with you. Mom, why are you asking me this? I'm just trying to eat dinner. <sighs> Now, you may be wondering why I'm telling you all this. Number one, I need your prayer. <laughs> number two, if any of you are trained in exorcisms, let me know. But number three, and most importantly, I've discovered that Easter means different things to different people. For example, most of us today, 2,000 years after the crucifixion of Christ, Easter is a global praise party where we join the worldwide chorus singing and praying and preaching and worshiping our Savior Jesus Christ who rose from the dead and declared victory over death. Hallelujah! And yet... That might be what Easter means to us now, but that's certainly not what it meant then. For when we read the 24th chapter of Luke, we find that the very first Easter wasn't a praise party. It was a funeral procession. For on the very first Easter Sunday morning, we interrupt three women, Mary Magdalene, Joanna, and Mary, the mother of James, who are making their way to the tomb, not to praise God, but to bury God. These women were the trusted supporters of Jesus. And unlike many other women in the ancient Near East, they, they had their own financial means. And they used their resources to provide for Jesus and for his disciples convinced of his power, and completely sold out for his mission, they spent the last few years of their lives following him. From city to city, from place to place, they were the ones who organized, who prepared, who invested in Jesus because they believed in him, and they believed that he would transform the world. That is, until Friday came. And all their hopes, all their dreams, all their expectations were stripped, beaten, nailed to a cross, and died. You see, the Jesus they'd seen heal others, include others, feed others, and raise others from the dead was now dead himself. And here, these women are confronted with a quandary that every disciple who follows Jesus will one day face. What do I do when God has disappointed me? What do I do when I prayed for this, but God did that? What do I do when I planned for this, but God planned for that? What do I do when what I wanted, what I dreamed, what I expected from Jesus isn't what Jesus is doing at all? These are the questions that Joanna, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of James, were weighing on the first Easter Sunday morning. And if we're really honest, these are the questions that weigh on us too. 
Because following Jesus doesn't mean we won't be disappointed. Following Jesus doesn't mean we won't experience death. For we all have had experiences or we will have experiences where we were expecting something from God, where we were hoping in something from Jesus only to find that what we dreamed had died. And it's there. It's there in that place of defeat and disappointment that so many disciples stay. In fact, it may even be where some of you are this Easter Sunday morning. But if you hear nothing else, hear this. It isn't where you have to stay. God teaches us through this text how to have victory over death and disappointment. And the first lesson is this. Don't let your disappointment derail your devotion. You see, Joanna, Mary, and Mary Magdalene have just watched as all they hoped and dreamed now lies dead and buried. And with the death of Jesus, we would expect their devotion to him to die too. After all, it did for the disciples. The 11 are not making their way to the tomb. They're disappointed in God. And so they've given up on their devotion. And isn't that what we do? We stop worshiping. We stop serving. We stop learning, we stop growing in our faith because it's hard to devote ourselves to someone who has disappointed us. Okay, some of you are are looking at me a little confused. You're, You're perhaps really holy and you never get disappointed in God. So let me talk to the sinners in the room like me. You don't have to raise your hand. It's hard to serve someone who has disappointed you. And we know this not just because of scripture, but because of skinny pop. Now, if you don't know what skinny pop popcorn is, uh, let me bless you today. After service, stop by the grocery store. uh, There's about two million uh, servings for only two calories. That's what I tell myself. You're welcome and enjoy. I I asked my husband last week, as he was coming home from the grocery store, pick me up a bag of skinny pop. And he said, of course, my beloved wife, who always picks up things from me, who never forgets my request, who I've pledged my life to, my queen, my liege, no problem. Now, I may be embellishing that last part, but you understand the gist. And so I was excited when he came in the door expecting to receive what I had asked for. But no, he just smiled and said, I forgot. (laughs) Don't, Don't worry, I'll get it next time. And so what did I do? The Christian, pastor, and loving wife. For the next three hours, whenever he asked for something, I said, don't worry, I'll do it another time. Yes, the remote was sitting right next to me and I could have easily handed it to him, but no, I said, I'll do it another time. Yes, we were sitting at the dinner table and the pepper and salt were sitting next to me and he asked me to pass it and I said, oh, I'll do it another time. Now, was it petty? Yes. Was it pastoral? No. Was it Christian? No. Why? Because it's hard to serve someone who disappoints you. And even harder when that someone is God. But what would it look like if our devotion was not disrupted by our disappointment? Well, what would it look like if God could depend on you the way you depend on God. Well, I'll tell you what it would look like. It would look like someone over here who's lost someone they loved and still showed up. It would look like someone over here who's battling a diagnosis and still showed up. It would look like someone up there who's searching for a job and still showed up. It would look like someone back 
here who's struggling in their marriage and still showed up. It would look like someone who's been hurt by the church, who's deconstructing their faith, but still showed up. It looks like you and you and you. It looks like Joanna, Mary Magdalene, and Mary, the mother of Joseph, who are disappointed with God, who might be angry with God, whose hearts have been broken by God, but still showed up. Because you see, victory over death begins with our devotion. Don't miss this. Death and disappointment can only defeat you if it buries your faith. Death and disappointment can only defeat you if it kills your commitment. But when Joanna, Mary Magdalene, and Mary still show up to serve Jesus, they teach us that death can never defeat the devoted. Because when they show up, they discover that Jesus is not dead, but he is risen as he said. They discover that Jesus is not defeated, but has defeated death itself. They discover Jesus is not powerless, but holds all power, all authority, all sovereignty, all control in his hands. They discover the hope of the resurrection, the undefeated love of God, and the limitless grace of salvation, but only because they showed up. And perhaps, perhaps that's the question that God has for each of us today. Will you show up? Will you show up? Will you show up for Jesus? When Easter is over, when all the, the eggs have been found, when the ham with the gold wrapper and the crispy crust has all been eaten, will you still show up for God? Will you show up to sing? Will you show up to pray? Will you show up to serve? Will you show up to give? Will you show up to lead? Will you show up to teach? Will you show up for Jesus? If you're not sure what your answer to that question might be, consider what happens when Joanna, Mary, and Mary Magdalene show up. They not only discover that Jesus is alive, but then they go back to the disciples and share the good news. Now, depending on your biblical translation, the disciples' response to the women's account is described as idle talk, nonsense, silly stories, or even ridiculous. But when Peter hears this idle, nonsensical, and ridiculous story, he has an altogether unique response. Peter gets up and runs straight to the tomb. Now this response is notable because the last time that our gospel writer referred to Peter was two chapters before, when he denied Jesus not once, not twice, but three times. But now, now because these women who were devoted showed up at the tomb, now because these women discovered a new story, a man who had been running away from Jesus is now running towards Jesus. What am I trying to say to you this Easter Sunday morning? The victory that you have over death through your devotion the victory that you have over death through the power of Jesus' resurrection is not just for you, but it's for someone who will hear it from you and run towards Jesus. 
Because here it is. We all have Peters in our lives. We have Peters at our jobs. Peters who live two blocks down. Peters who work in the next office over. Peters who share our last names. We all have people in our lives who feel distant from God, who hide away from the community of faith because they are haunted by their mistakes or the choices that they've made in the past. But that's where you come in. That's where you, Mary, Joanna, and Mary Magdalene share the crazy, good, nonsensical, and ridiculous news of a God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should have life and life everlasting. And when you share that story, all of a sudden, Someone who's been distant, someone who's been running away will start running towards Jesus. Someone who's ashamed and fearful and disconnected will hear the good news from you and start running towards God. Because you see, the true power of the resurrection is not just in the victory it gives us, but in the victory it gives us to share with others. And who knows? Who knows what mother, father, friend, tween, or child will come running to Jesus because of you? May you leave here this Sunday morning, knowing the real meaning of Easter, Jesus' victory over death that invites all of us to run straight to him.